Once upon a time, there lived two neighbors. One of them bought a shotgun. Uh-huh, thought the other. All right, I'll buy myself a bigger gun. What could this mean, thought the first neighbor. I'll buy myself something bigger. By the end of the 1960s, the Soviet Union seemed likely to match America's nuclear arsenal. The two superpowers faced a choice, slow down their competition, the process that would be called detente, or continue an arms race that could end in all-out war. In 1969, a new American president came to power. Richard Nixon had new ideas about how to make the Cold War less dangerous. He was ready to accept the Soviet Union as America's nuclear equal. When President Nixon came into office, the conventional wisdom of all the uh, media and the people who thought of themselves as intellectuals was that he was a warmonger and that they had to moderate him and we were under enormous pressure to start negotiations on trade, on salt, on a whole complex of things. This was not a foreign policy politician particularly in his early years. He had gained notoriety and power, as you know, on the wave of the great Red Scare, the great uh, uh, McCarthy period in American politics. He also knew, and this is very important, the bureaucracy. He knew that the, often the, the most difficult belligerent powers with which he had to deal were not the Soviet Union or China, but the Department of State, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, uh, uh, those belligerents arrayed along the Potomac. Although Nixon wanted to revise America's Cold War strategy, his first priority was to get American troops out of the war in Vietnam. By 1969, this war had cost the lives of 30,000 GIs, and there was still no end. When I became Secretary of Defense, there were 550,000 men on the ground in Vietnam, another 1,200,000 in Asia in the Navy and the Air Force supporting this operation. It was a big war. America's ally, President Thieu of South Vietnam, met Nixon on Midway Island. Nixon told Thieu he planned to pull out American troops and hand over the ground war to the South Vietnamese. Vietnamization was the term that I coined in order to get uh, people thinking about the responsibilities the Viet Vietnamese had there. So we came in and said, that's fine as long as, uh, you know, you uh, leave behind uh, a well-trained uh, South Vietnamese army uh, and equip us so that we could tear of our own destiny. In July 1969, the first American troops were pulled out. Both Nixon and Kissinger knew what it was doing to our society. Uh, the controversy, the distractions, the financial costs, the cost, the terrible human toll in terms of lives lost and wounded, not only of Americans, but Vietnamese and others and also the distractions from other foreign policy initiatives. It's one reason that Nixon and Kissinger wanted to open up with China and to improve relations with Russia, partly to try to bring pressure on the Vietnamese to negotiate a settlement, partly to show a dramatic forward movement of our foreign policy that we were not crippled and paralyzed by the Vietnam War. Hanoi had put on its own pressure with an offensive in the South American generals proposed bombing North Vietnam's bases in neutral Cambodia. Nixon agreed to the bombing, but insisted the raids in Cambodia be kept secret. Doors open at 30 PG. Can we have a 30 PG? Send 
Spider release. Ready, ready, now. Wow, I'm sorry. Ready, ready, now. I was all for bombing the sanctuaries in Cambodia, but I could not tell the President of the United States, the Secretary of State, or the National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger that I could keep it secret. And I thought it would be a very bad thing if that came out uh, at a later time. And I knew it would because we had 12,000 people that had all that information. And you just can't keep secrets. Laird was right. Anti-war demonstrators protested. They called out the names of soldiers killed in Vietnam. Richard Nixon could look out the window of the White House and see a mob of people uh, marching in the street protesting the war in Vietnam, for instance. He could take a three by five card out of his pocket and take a look. And the poll showed him with the confidence of 70, 75 percent of the American people. And he'd say, I'm not going to let those people in the street make foreign policy for this country. And so tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. I pledged in my campaign for the presidency to end the war in a way that we could win the peace. I have initiated a plan of action which will enable me to keep that pledge. The more support I can have from the American people, the sooner that pledge can be redeemed. For the more divided we are at home, the less likely the enemy is to negotiate. Nixon believed, I think correctly, that the opposition to the war was mostly about the draft and the casualties and not about the American presence. The Americans didn't care if we were bombing Hanoi. They didn't care if there were American airplanes around. What they didn't like was the fact that young American men were being drafted, sent to Vietnam, and being killed. The bombing of communist bases in Cambodia was no miracle cure. Okay. Uh, one zero zero meters away from it now, Jesse from air. American GIs still came under attack in South Vietnam. All right, who's wounded? All right, give me some cover. Okay, bring it, try and bring it back here. Remember to stop the bleeding. You gotta stop. Nixon now ordered a ground assault into Cambodia. Anybody, anybody out here? Do you feel the people are united behind you, Mr. President? Uh, as far as the people are concerned, I have no judgment on that. Uh, all that I can say is that I know that I did what I believed was right, and in what really matters is, as far as the people are concerned, is whether it comes out right. If it comes out right, that's what really matters. Nixon's invasion of Cambodia produced violent protests on American campuses. At Kent State University, National Guardsmen shot four students dead. Every year, in the early spring and late autumn, the Soviet army gets its new recruits. The forces are inconceivable without strong, agile men possessing stamina. These are fighting.